Okay. <clears throat> now we finished with cholesterol synthesis, triglyceride synthesis, triglyceride breakdown, um, and then the question of medication scheme. Let's talk about we talk about some medications. Now, in order to understand this medication, we have to know like some type of lipids. Okay, lipids. <clears throat> now we'll learn most in on on Tuesday too, or on Wednesday when you start digestive system. But there's the thing, lipids are water insoluble. Lipids are water insoluble. Okay, lipids are water insoluble. If they're water insoluble, that means there's problem in blood when you carry them in blood. So when you take these lipids into blood from your intestine, there's a problem. So we have to solve this problem, and we must have lipid carriers. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So what is absorbed? Let's just talk about this. Just to that's a good question. So now you remind me of something. Let's say this is intestine. Intestine and here you have blood. Remember lipids are absorbed first into lymphatic. Maybe you don't know that that's okay. So let's say lymphatics or lymph. And then from lymph they're absorbed into blood. Okay, so lipid goes from intestine into lymph, from lymph into blood. In blood, the lipid that we absorb are known as chylomicron. In intestine, chylomicrons are, are made. Chylomicrons. Remember this name for now. It will make more sense when we, when we start next week GI. But again, I, right now we just want to talk about cellular metabolism. So to get to that level, I want to give you a brief overview sort of like making a plan how to understand lipids in cells okay chylomicron <clears throat> are made of there's certain there uh, a bunch of lipids grouped together in the center you have different lipids in the center you have triglyceride and then this is surrounded by a layer of cholesterol and this is surrounded by soluble lipid which is phospholipid this is chylomicron okay green the outer layer is phospholipid let me label it you know what might as well label it you know sometimes you can ask me please so if, if it's not making sense just tell me, please label it it's okay you can ask me okay phospholipid okay <clears throat> blue so green is phospholipid and then blue is <clears throat> cholesterol and then red is triglyceride red is triglyceride blue is phospho where is let me just change it to blue blue <coughs> is cholesterol this is a chylomicron it's made of different lipids now but chylomicron itself is not completely soluble you see that phospholipid are soluble in water right so the head of phospholipids we haven't discussed it yet they're water soluble like you cell membrane and on top of that there will be some proteins you'll add proteins you know proteins are water soluble okay there's one protein known as beta 48 beta 48 purple let's call it beta 48 beta 48 this is known as epoprotein epoprotein it's supposed to make this lipid more soluble as well well, I mean, I just draw one, but it's multiple. Okay, okay it's not like a coating it. No. So it's an embedding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just like plasma membrane, right? The plasma membrane is made of phospholipid, right? And then you have this chunk of protein embedded here and there and there and there to make it more soluble. And there should be also protein C. Protein C. What color is left? Yellow. There you go. Protein C2. Yellow should be C2. There you go. This is C2. C2 is a, a phospholipase activator. So phospholipase is then needed to break this back to fatty acid, cholesterol, and triglyceride. <laughs> it's just for transport purposes. The beta 48 is required for its transport from GI 
into blood okay <clears throat> into blood so let's say this gets transported this is chylomicron see chylomicron has different parts it has triglyceride cholesterol phospholipid and apoproteins 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 in this case we want to talk about two of them right now apoprotein c and apoprotein b we have two versions 148 in this case it's the 48 okay beta 48 <clears throat> Once chylomicron, let's say we trans were successful in transporting it, there was no deficiency of these proteins or anything, and this was transported all the way to blood. In blood, <coughs> you have lipase, they swim around, plasma lipase, and they need protein C to activate them. Once you do that, so then this chylomicron is broken down back to what are greens? Phospholipids. What are reds? Triglyceride. And then what is blue? Cholesterol. <clears throat> okay, so it's then it's broken down into these with the help of phospholipase. In the blood or in the liver? In the blood. Not yet liver. Not yet liver. Okay. <clears throat> now once you do that now we have something else we have plasma apoproteins look b48 was gi apoprotein produced by the enterocytes c by the enterocyte now we're talking about plasma apoprotein plasma apoprotein okay <clears throat> so we have something known as ldl very ldl and hdl so these are, look what H stands for, high, L for low, V for very, D for density, and L for lipoprotein, lipoproteins, lipoproteins, <clears throat> okay. So once we do this, now let's say we are in blood, everything is in blood, and you broke chylomicron into this. <clears throat> So LDL, LDL is primarily, see LDL is 60% cholesterol, it's primarily cholesterol, LDL, primarily cholesterol plus apoproteins. So we'll take the red ones, combine them, okay so we took the red one and combined them and then we add to them proteins, proteins, let's say in this case they will have Oh, oh, not a good choice, not a good choice. There you go. They will have this. Let's say these are B100. B100. So, apoprotein B100. Okay. <clears throat> and then apoprotein A. Uh, what color should I use? Orange? Okay, okay. I'm going to soon run out of colors. This is LDL. See, LDL is low density, right? Low density. So let's say this is 100, beta 100, and orange was what? A. A. Okay. <clears throat> These are the apoprotein that attaches to. So majority of this, of this particle, see this is a complex of lipids and protein, correct? LDL is a complex of protein and lipids. Let's say 50% of this is, or 60, 50% is cholesterol. And then about 20% will be triglyceride, okay? And then about other 20 or 30 percent will be protein so it has less protein c composition now if you put protein in water you have a bucket of water you put protein in it and you have put lipid in it <laughs> who goes to the bottom who stays on top protein, protein in the bottom because why heavy. it's heavy it's more dense it's more dense so when we say low density lipoprotein it is still a lipoprotein lipoprotein it's made of lipids and protein don't forget that all LDL, VLDL, HL, they're all lipoproteins. They're all lipoprotein. There's still a combination, a complex of lipids and proteins. But in LDL, there's more lipid, less protein. Especially which lipid? Cholesterol. So it's a lipoprotein that mostly is made of cholesterol. Cholesterol. So it's a there's therefore it's a major cholesterol carrier in plasma. Okay. Now this cholesterol can be carried into liver to be converted to steroid hormone bile salts and things like that or it could be carried to 
<clears throat> adrenal gland where you can make steroid hormones for example or or testes to make testosterone or ovaries to make estrogen and progesterone or adrenal cortex to make androgens or cortisol or aldosterone all steroid hormones we'll discuss that so know that depending where it goes the beta 100 is tissue specific so beta 100 takes them depending which tissue has the receptor for them it's tissue specific but on liver you have LDL receptors on other tissue you have LDL receptors and I'll talk about statin statin increase liver LDL receptors believe it or not we'll talk about it so at least now you know that look LDL depend where it goes if the need is in the tissue, it will go to tissue. If the need is in the liver, it will go to the liver. It depends on you what you do. Now, the next thing is VLDL. VLDL is high in triglyceride. VLDL is 60% triglyceride. About 20%, let's say, or 25% cholesterol. And then 25% protein. HDL is high density. High density. <clears throat> so, VL, in, in this case, very low density there's there's a lot less protein a lot less protein in HDL it's 40% protein 40% protein so another way to look at it is look let's look at protein concentration of these roughly speaking in HDL there's 40% protein in LDL let's say there's 30% protein and then in very low 20% all of this depends on protein concentration. Are these numbers something that we should know? No. Or no, no, no. Just, just know that HDL has more protein compared to lipids. VLDL has more lipids than protein. And LDL, moderate, still more lipids than protein. Okay, but in terms of density, the more protein you have, the more dense. The less protein you have, the less dense a molecule is. All of these are lipoproteins. If they're lipoprotein focus on the L, that means they're combination of protein and lipids. It's not just lipid, it's not just protein. It's a combination, it's a complex. And the lipoproteins, they're known as, these proteins are lipid carrier proteins in plasma. They're like taxis, they're like planes, they're like whatever else you bicycle, your own cars. They carry things around. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> so hopefully this helps. Now, Protein component is apple protein? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now let's talk about medication. Once you know this, it would help more. So, <clears throat> HDL, high density lipoprotein, think about it, it primarily brings cholesterol to the liver. Okay, now let's talk about the jobs. What do they do? So, yeah, HDL, it primarily takes cholesterol and lipids away from blood into liver. So HDL is supposed to decrease plasma cholesterol, correct? And it does. HDL decreases plasma cholesterol. How? It takes cholesterol, brings it to liver. What's another name for liver? Hepata. So HDL, hepatodl. H for he liver or hepata. Okay? Don't use the L because LDL will make you confused. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> now think of LDL lethal 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 LDL is really bad it's lethal look it's not bad by nature with that cholesterol we cannot be men or female it's huge cholesterol gives us makes us survive cholesterol is essential for survivalship but when I say lethal that means if you have too much free cholesterol then it's bad okay okay LDL is the bad form of cholesterol HDL is the happy H for happy, L for lethal, LDL lethal, HDL happy cholesterol. Okay. All right. Now we can talk about drugs known as statins. Statins. <clears throat> and bile acid, bile acid, racines. That's another category of drugs. And then you have niacin. Am I missing something? I'm missing one category unless I'm confusing myself but anyhow statin the one we said was what what are the names of statins atorvastatin simvastatin lovastatin 
Muhammad, move a statin. You know, you can have all as long as it's statin. You know, okay. Okay, <clears throat> more statin. That's not good. That's minor. Munir more. Uh, bile acid resins. What's their name? Cholestyramine. And cholestapol. Okay, niacin is niacin, right? What's what's the precursor of niacin? Tryptophan. Tryptophan. Very good. Very good. Okay. I feel like I'm missing one more. Fibrates. There oh, you yeah, go. Fibrates. I don't fibrate. Now these are <coughs> gym fibrosol, phenofibrate and so forth. Gym fibrosol, right? Okay, let's focus on their mechanism. Statins. So now what do statins do? Let's focus on LDL. Statins lowers LDL. Okay. Statins will increase HDL. And statins will decrease VLDL. Let me put the H on top so just so it's not confusing. We'll start with a very low VL. DL and then we have LDL and then we have HDL okay <coughs> VL DL LDL HDL same thing here VL DL LDL HDL and HDL okay and it'll include here known as the LDL receptor. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Statins. Their main job is to decrease LDL. They also decrease VLDL, but they will increase HDL. That's what they do, and they increase LDL receptors. Bile acid racing. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, they will decrease LDL. Okay. HDL they have less effect on HDL but they will <coughs> they will increase VLDL okay niacin their main goal is they act on what HDL they decrease this they will decrease this okay let's put it this way fibrates the major function is to decrease VLDL they will decrease LDL too and they will increase HDL mildly but now let's I'll, I'll color the one that is the most important part of this so statin primarily acts it's good for what decreasing LDL okay <clears throat> um, niacin is good for decreasing or increasing HDL and then fibrate is good for decreasing VLDL and then bile acid racing for LDL and then I'll tell you the mechanism okay okay mechanism of action of statin was H M G whoever tells me about fibrate I'll I'll give you bonus for my for Tuesday H M G Coy reductase. Okay, so that's what statins will do. Bile acid raisin, what do you think? If it's known as bile acid racines, it attaches to bile acids. It conjugates bile acids. So <clears throat> this will conjugate bile acid. Bile acid conjugation in the intestine. intestine okay HMG core you're okay with it right because we did that cycle so I don't have to go over this we're okay with this bile acid racing what it does you see bile acids are secreted where again it will require some GI GI knowledge we'll do that next week but know that bile acids are made in the liver stored in the gallbladder 
and then secrete it into the duodenum, second part of duodenum, second part of duodenum. Bile acid is just like a soap. Bile salts and bile acids. Guess what? They're biological soap, not factory-made soap that are sold in on stores or in Walgreens or whatever else. You know. Now you know what soap does? Soap washes lipids off your hands, off your skin. Correct? That means it makes lipids soluble. Soluble in what? In water, because you still have to use water, which means <clears throat> soap is amphipathic. Amphipathic, this term is used for things that are soluble in water and lipid at the same time. How could that be? If there's a molecule, one end is water soluble, the other end is lipid soluble. So this part will break lipids and it will make attached lipid, this part will attach to water. At the end, you're breaking lipids and you're washing them away. That's what bile acids do too. So let's say you eat cheese, pizza, or whatever, and then it reaches your duodenum, and the gallbladder will automatically release bile acid in that area to break down the fat goblet. So the first step in lipid digestion or breakdown is what? Bile acid. That's what bile acids do. Now, but bile acids are made in the liver. This is the important part. Bile acids are made in the liver from cholesterol. Simply taking cholesterol and modifying it is becomes bile acid. Let me show you the shape. You know the shape of, uh, so again, I'll erase this so you guys know by now. The mechanism of these two at least you know what cholesterol looks like right I can erase this too just to make myself more room <clears throat> you know cholesterol looks something like this very good four rings correct so that's cholesterol <clears throat> now bile acid is a cholesterol or a steroid ring at this position you can add to it taurine which is an amino acid or glycine then it becomes bile acid bile acid this is one bile acid the second one quickly and in this case we add to them what the amino acid glycine now this is they are the two types of bile acid okay the amino acid you know that's water soluble so this is the hydrophilic part the amino acid part and the cholesterol part is hydrophobic lipid soluble part now you can additionally add to this sodium chloride and soap would make it bile salt so where are they made they are made in the liver because the source of amino acids you can do transamination reaction or deamination reaction or amination reactions in the liver liver is the only place so this is called conjugation of cholesterol the conjugation step okay <clears throat> and this is done in the liver now <clears throat> that means liver continuously take up what cholesterol from plasma okay so let me tell you the next thing let's say here I have to do this because I'd, otherwise you will not understand this is liver and from liver you have the bile duct coming to the duodenum Duodenum is part of the GI, that is a C-shaped structure. Food coming from stomach, let's say. Okay, so food is coming from stomach. So here you go. Let's see. This is this is lipid coming from stomach. It reaches the duodenum. Oh oh. Do we have a charger? We don't. Yeah, it's plugged in. Is it plugged in? Yes, it's not in the computer. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> so when lipid reaches here, then bile coming from the gallbladder and liver will be released here. In this case, let's say bile is this green. It's released, it will break down this big goblet of lipid okay big goblet of lipid who breaks them bile it's just like cutting a pizza into pies that's what it does <coughs> so that means we, we require bile for what for lipid breakdown correct that's one thing you need to get to know the second thing is bile is made of cholesterol if bile is made of cholesterol i mean i should say bile acid sorry cholesterol bile acid is made of cholesterol correct that means you have to bring cholesterol where into the liver to convert it to 
bile acid or bile salts so that means liver continuously takes up cholesterol from blood so essentially in blood cholesterol will decrease and in liver it will increase now <clears throat> later on when you reach the terminal ileum when you reach the terminal ileum let just i don't think i have so later on the same bile when bile does its job <clears throat> When bile acid and bile salt does its job, break down lipids, they are recycled. They are reabsorbed. Bile salts. They are reabsorbed and taken back where? To the liver. And then they're secreted back and stored in the gallbladder and then as, as you need. And they can be used later on. This is, let's say this is gallbladder. They can be reused. The thing for that is, remember when you talked about NADPH? Do you remember that? <clears throat> when do you need NADPH? detoxification cholesterol synthesis steroid synthesis and one of them was bile acid synthesis so it's very expensive to make bile and you don't want to just waste it so you have to recycle them about 90 percent of bile acid and salt are recycled back but guess what <clears throat> let's say this is bile this green or this yellow dot red dot if you take this bile and attach to this bile salt <clears throat> attach to this bile salt bile acid racing I'll put R then this can no longer be reabsorbed these medication known as cholestyramine and cholestopol then do nothing more they attach they conjugate to bile acids and the bile acid becomes too large too bulky you cannot reabsorb them if you can't reabsorb what happens to them they are excreted in stool they are excreted in stool and what happens to recycling of bile salts decreases now your liver says, oh my God, I don't have bile salts. What is it going to do? It has to make new. To make new bile salts, what does liver have to do? Increase uptake of cholesterol. Very good, Nina. So this is how you simply are increasing the transport of cholesterol from blood into liver. And what happens to plasma cholesterol level? It drops, it decreases. And that's why these drugs work. They're safe. That's the good thing. They're safe. But know the mechanism. Know the mechanism. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> if you remove your gallbladder, what happens to? It's not regular, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's say, let's say a patient removes their gallbladder. <clears throat> The first two, three months will be difficult for them. Each time they eat fatty food, they will have pain and some discomfort, maybe diarrhea. Okay? Later on, the body adjusts. With a few months, the body will adjust because the body says, you know what, the livers are producing more frequently. So the body will adjust. But regulation still CCK. Still CCK. Okay? Nothing has changed. It's just you don't have the temporary storage place. <coughs> okay. All right, so statin mechanism, you know, bile salt mechanism, you know, niacin. Do you know the mechanism of niacin? It's unknown. <laughs> Thank you. We don't know exactly how it increases or decreases HDL, incre increase HDL and how it decreases LDL. There's no clear-cut evidence, but just know that the mechanism of niacin is to increase HDL, 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 HDL. Yeah. Yeah, niacin is amino. I mean, uh, a vitamin. Yeah. B. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, how about fibrates? Yeah. So, <clears throat> at the end of the day, that's the side effect, actually. Fibrates, huh? Yeah. It increases beta oxidation and it increases hormone sensitive lipase this is how it does so fibrates will increase <clears throat> this is actually good for triglycerides so when you have too much triglyceride in the liver I mean in blood so number one it will it will increase metabolism of triglyceride meaning that you convert triglyceride to fatty acids okay so it's usually used for that so to break them down that means you need hormone sensitive lipase so it activates hormone sensitive lipase and so forth all the effects of triglyceride breakdown how about that would that help 
that's what it does fibrates increase all effects of increasing breakdown of triglyceride whatever causes breakdown of triglyceride fibrates do that and it's assumption again it's assumption there's no clear cut evidence as far as i know <clears throat> okay now so that's you should know their mechanism the next thing is you should know their side effect or their use when would you use statins when LDL is very high okay when LDL is high <clears throat> or when you, somebody has hyperlipidemia now LDL is the same thing as cholesterol. cholesterol so when your plasma cholesterol level is high then use statins one would use bile acid when you have increase in LDL when you have increase in cholesterol but let's say you are sensitive to statins or statins toxicity then you will substitute with what bad acid racing okay <clears throat> niacin what would you use niacin we have low on, uh, HDL. very good when you have low hdl and high LDL. ldl a combination okay when we use fibrate when you have high vldl <clears throat> See, liver can use both, but naturally, what HDL does is naturally brings cholesterol to the liver. LDL takes it everywhere, but what you can do is you can selectively shunt that back to the liver. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so that's their use. Side effects. Let's go to the side effect. Statins. You know the two, right? Myositis and hepatitis. Good job. Bile acid racing no side effect excellent yeah that's all there is exactly it's never absorbed it's excreted in stool so maybe the most nausea vomiting and diarrhea okay very good niacin <coughs> sweating yeah before rush something else yeah let's just include rush that's fine it's actually lack of it that but it, too much of it will also cause rush how about increased blood flow to your skin what would you call that Flushing the skin, yeah. there you go yeah, yeah. okay <clears throat> um, fibrates what do you think fibrates fibrates it doesn't affect cholesterol that much so cholesterol in, in in bile will increase so this puts you at risk of gallstones gallstone this and in, in bile acid racing they put you at risk of gallstones bile acid racing as well okay <clears throat> okay so now these medications yeah okay so that's for those medications the last thing we want to do today is and then hopefully we have enough time for me to give you some guidelines for Tuesday not no study guide just I want to go over some stuff that are important yeah okay there's something known as phospholipids phospholipids Please remember phospholipids. We, I've discussed them before on day one, so I'm not going to go over it. Phospholipid is two fatty acid attached to one glycerol. And to the same glycerol, at the position three, you have phosphate attached. If I were to draw glycerol, this was glycerol, correct? OH, OH, OH. Let's see, here's a fatty acid, here's a fatty acid, and here is a phosphate. That's phospholipid. It's almost like a triglyceride. Instead of having three fatty acids, it has two plus one phosphate. In books, you've probably seen they look like this. They have the head and the two tails. The head is the phosphate and the two tails are the fatty acids. Okay. <clears throat> now, phospholipids. Phospholipids, cell membrane are made of what? Phospholipids, correct? So, phospholipid can be converted to a rocky 
hydrocodonic acid and there's an enzyme right here what do you call this enzyme phospholipase A2 okay and then arachidonic acid can further be converted to prostaglandins Let's say prostaglandin F, prostaglandin E, prostaglandin D, doesn't matter. And then they can also be converted to. Okay, that should be there. One more. I think I can make it here. <clears throat> Thromboxin A2. And one last one prostacyclin, which is prostaglandin I2. These are all twos. Okay. <clears throat> now prostaglandin PG. Prostaglandin. Okay, that's prostaglandin. The PG stands for prostaglandin in each case. So prostaglandin, prostaglandin, prostaglandin. That means there are about four types of prostaglandin, at least what I'm telling you. Okay, prostaglandin D2, prostaglandin E2, F2, I2. Okay, and then TXA, thromboxin. TSA stands for thromboxin. I think it should be in your book, but I'll spell it for you. Thromboxin. Okay, so that's for prostaglandin. The same arachidonic acid can be converted to leukotriene. Leukotriene. Okay, leukotriene. <clears throat> Let's say leukotriene C, but it's called leukotriene C4. And then leukotriene. D and then look at try in E. It can also be converted to another look at try known as look at try in B4. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Which page is this on? 50? 50. 58. Very good. So here we have an enzyme, enzyme number two. And this one is on a cyclooxygenase. COX-1 and 2. There's two versions of it. COX-1 and COX-2 for short abbreviation. <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is with arachidonic acid, there's not enough room. You know it now. I'm going to put AA. That's arachidonic acid. And then you have enzyme number 3 here, known as lipo oxygenase or lox <clears throat> okay so you have them in your book so i don't think it's you please memorize this one okay do me a favor just memorize this whole thing it's not that difficult okay now i can tell you let's start with <clears throat> prostaglandin in this case you know let's do this the one that i do in green they all have the same function these guys have the same function and this one has a different function one in yellow uh oh that's not good what color should I use okay so different colors different use <clears throat> let's start with uh, thromboxin A2 first thromboxin A2 you should know their function thromboxin look at the name thrombo thrombo so it causes thrombosis it's pro thrombotic factor so thromboxin a2 causes thrombosis thrombosis write that down it should be on this next page in your book on the first page i give you like a sign on the next page is explanation 59 should explain everything under each category there should be so thromboxin a2 causes thrombosis how does it do that by platelet aggregation platelet aggregation that means platelets are combined together stacked on top of one another that's what thromboxin A2 would do thromboxin A2 causes platelet aggregation platelet aggregation and it also causes vasoconstriction vasoconstriction two things platelet activation platelet aggregation that I make I made it just three now wow okay three things <laughs> Platelet activation, 
platelet aggregation and vasoconstriction. Who does that? Thromboxin A2. Now, in order to understand it, the best way to memorize thromboxin A2 is it is it is pro-thrombotic factor. It is anti-bleeding factor. Its natural purpose is to prevent bleeding. The natural purpose of thromboxin A2 is to prevent bleeding. How do you prevent bleeding if there is a cut? First, you have to seal that cut. Very good. If you want to seal it, that means you have to clog it with what? With platelets. That's why it causes platelet aggregation and activation. Second thing you can prevent bleeding by is by vasoconstriction. If you cause vasoconstriction, less blood flow to that region, that means less leakage of blood. So it does all of that. Now, thromboxin A2 is produced by platelet themselves. It's also produced by endothelial cells. Okay, especially platelets makes thromboxin A2. So as the platelet ruptures, it releases thromboxin A2. Now, initially, you should think about it. You know, if there is endothelium trauma, you know what is endothelium, guys? The inner lining of all blood vessels is known as endothelium. It's very smooth, beautiful, silky, amazing, glassy looking layer of blood vessels. But guess what? When people smoke, when they drink, when they have too much cholesterol, when they have hypertension, when they get infected, that area can become rough. Now, endothelium trauma is one of them. When endothelial trauma occurs, that means there is endothelial tear. And this will lead to rough edges. Platelet, remember, they are just being carried away by water or plasma. Like a little tube in water. You know, it just goes banks around all corner. Now, when the platelet comes and hits those sharp edges, what happens to them? They burst. When they burst, what are they going to release? Thromboxin A2. It's, it's amazing how it works. The damage induces thrombosis itself. So number one cause of all thrombotic event is endothelium trauma. It's natural. It makes sense. You know that when you have trauma, it should be repaired. And the repair mechanism should be activated by the trauma itself. Yeah. So that's what thromboxin A2 does. It is produced by endothelium trauma. <clears throat> and that's because of the rupture of platelets, platelets, platelets. And, but it acts on platelets. It activates platelets to clog up, to stack on top of one another. Okay, and that's known as platelet aggregation. But at the same time, it will cause vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction. Okay? <clears throat> now, if you, if you forget how to remember thromboxin to think of T <coughs> trauma induced trauma induced endothelium damage is crossed it's tightened up like when you cross maybe that would help I don't know okay <laughs> bad example <laughs> okay next thing prostaglandins prostaglandins the one that's most important amongst the green prostaglandin is E2 E2 D and F has the same thing but E2 is the most important one it is a vasodilator. It's a vasodilator. E2 is a smooth muscle relaxant. Smooth muscle relaxant. Smooth muscle relaxant. You see, as long as you know this one term, prostaglandin E2 causes smooth muscle relaxation. It should be in your book. Memorize it right now or write it down right now. Thromboxin E2, prostaglandin E2 causes smooth muscle relaxation. Are you okay with that? smooth muscle relaxation now all your blood vessels are made of smooth muscle when smooth muscles are relaxed blood vessels will expand it increases blood flow and it decreases blood pressure so that's what it does prostaglandin E2 will cause vasodilation vasodilation when your blood vessels dilate they can leak more it can lead to edema <clears throat> when blood vessels dilate blood pressure decreases so it can cause shock Think, for, think along those lines. Prostaglandin E2 decreases blood pressure. So that's in blood vessels. But you also have smooth muscle in the uterus. So prostaglandin E2 will also act on the uterus. So instead of causing uterine contraction, it will cause uterine relaxation. relaxation. So there is a medication. There is a medication which is prostaglandin E2 analog. Prostaglandin E2 analog. Very good. So you can use that. We can use that. Also, let me give you one more thing. Do you know that in children, 
there is a communication should I come to it right now or just once I finish okay just keep for now I'll come back just know the prostaglandin E2 smooth muscle relaxant wherever you have smooth muscle it will cause relaxation of that specifically blood vessels and uterus focus on those two blood vessels and uterus blood vessel and uterus okay and I'll come back please remind me once I finish talking about this to tell you what are the clinical significance of that now prostaglandin I2 is also known as prostacyclin it has a name additional to prostaglandin I2 known <coughs> as prostacyclin prostacyclin that's I2 okay now I2 is the opposite of thromboxin A2 I2 is the opposite of thromboxin A2 you can call it thromboxin A2 inhibitor I4 inhibitor which means what guys thromboxin A2 and I2 regulate blood viscosity if I2 is too much bleeding will occur if a thromboxin A2 is too much then thrombotic events will occur so they keep the blood in check everything of thromboxin A2 prostaglandin I2 does the opposite are we good with that okay <clears throat> look at trienes let's think of B first that's why I have it out of the cycle B is for <clears throat> blood cell recruitment bring me to the side of inflammation all leukotrienes are pro-inflammatory leukotrienes are pro-inflammatory <clears throat> now somebody asked me earlier double bonds whenever you have double bonds the name of those things will end with in okay <clears throat> you see all of these are made of acosonides acosonides should look like this you don't have to memorize them almost like a fish or like in matrix Mazin is not gonna like this you know in matrix movie they have those fishes going around swimming something like that like an octopus what does arachidonic mean spider in Latin spider like so the the phospholipid that's coming to arachidonic acid looks like this just to show you what does this look like spider <laughs> you further modify it if you modify it further you can convert it to this okay so <clears throat> all right but in any case number one leukotrienes the leuko part let's write it down leuko comes from white blood cells leukotrienes are produced by white blood cells leukocytes right another name for white blood cell is what leukocytes leukocytes so leukocytes produce <clears throat> a chemical known as leukotriene why triene because they have three double bonds they have three double bonds three all of them let's there's one there's two and there's the third one look at triene okay just for the sake of I don't know where exactly the double bonds are but who cares that's what look at trienes are called number one they have three double bonds two they're produced by white blood cells <clears throat> and they are used for white blood cell recruitment they're used for communication between white blood cells so look at trying B4 is produced by the endothelial cells and white blood cells and it causes recruitment of white blood cells to the side of injury wherever you have an injury so that means when you bring white blood cells to the side of injury that's inflammation you cannot bring white blood cells without water so at the end of the day that will cause edema and swelling and pain and increased blood flow, heat, temperature, redness, all of that. So know that leukotriene B4, think about it, bring leukotriene B for bringing. This is a chemotaxic factor. Chemotaxis. Chemotaxis meaning movement, taxi means movement, chemo means chemical. Movement because of chemical concentration. Okay, so the more uh, leukotriene 4 you have in this area, the more white blood cell will go to that area. Okay. Now look at try and C, D, and E. They are known as smooth muscle contractor. They cause smooth muscle contraction. Unlike prostaglandin, which was caused smooth muscle relaxation. These guys cause smooth muscle contraction. So and by doing that, it leads to vasoconstriction and bronchoconstriction. Especially bronchoconstriction. 
focus on the bronch constriction part of it. Bronch constriction, bronch constriction, bronch constriction. Okay. Look at trains. Lung constriction, L for lungs. Look at trains, lung. Bronch constriction, so it will cause asthmatic attack. And then blood vessels will leak, will cause edema. Lung contraction, leakage of blood vessels. Anaphylactic shock to you. Okay, so that's leukotrienes. So the trains do uh, that shock and they yeah. into a hypothetic shock? Yeah. If you have too much of them, yeah, they'll cause. <coughs> Sometimes allergic reaction can increase these guys too. Yeah. Okay, so now we know. Let's do something else now. <coughs> I told you I will come back to Trombox in A2, I think. Plastic gland in E2, sorry. Let's go come back to that first. What is <coughs> LAM? LAM. So here it says LAM. 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 Leukocyte antigen molecule. I don't know. I have no idea. Just look it up. <laughs> Yeah, probably some abbreviation in my head, I forgot. L-A-M. Oh, leukocyte adhesion molecule. Thank you. Huh. Leukocyte adhesion molecule. Huh? No, it's a molecule. Yeah, <clears throat> it's a receptor. It allows white blood cells to attach to the surface of endothelium. Leukocyte adhesion molecule. Huh? Yeah. So, if they don't attach, think of it this way. Now, how many of you have uh, Robin's pathology? Yeah. All of you should. Please don't say no. It's required, right? And I'll touch chocolate to check on Tuesday. <laughs> okay. Now, for white blood cells to leave the blood vessels, look, blood is being moving in a fast pace. So these white blood cells, how do they know when to get out? They should express leukocyte adhesion molecule. On the endothelium and they can attach when they attach there's the trap now when the trap they can go to these small gaps they will squeeze through them and then leave so LAM leukocyte adhesion molecule is required for that otherwise water wall or uh, blood flow will wash the way you'll never get it leave okay and Robbins I think in the inflammatory chapter they give you beautiful pictures you should see how extravasation of white blood cells occurs okay <clears throat> now let's go back to here prostaglandin i mean this enzyme phospholipase a2 this is inhibited by corticosteroid group of medication known as steroids or corticosteroids corticosteroids inhibits this pathway and if you do that, that means you will have nothing beyond this point. Everything is stopped. No leukotrienes, no thromboxin A2, and no prostaglandins. So this is, that's why steroids are the best anti-inflammatory. You know, the core of inflammation is white blood cell recruitment. If you can prevent white blood cell from leaving blood vessels into the site of inflammation, that is done. Inflammation is activation of white blood cells. And when you activate white blood cells, they have to leave blood vessels. When they leave blood vessels, they have to leave through gaps. When you have increased gap in vessels, that means leakage of fluid. And that leads to edema and swelling. To prevent all of that, this is why when you have swelling or some sort of trauma, you, you know you have swelling, you have pain, you have warm to touch, and redness. And these are signs of inflammation. But the basis of that is vasodilation, or at least the gap between blood vessels increases between blood vessel cells or endothelium so things can leak out now these guys will do that they help in that all of these are pro-inflammatory all of them are pro-inflammatory yeah mm. Mm. very good question see inflammation is a defense mechanism that's very true with that inflammation how it's almost like saying you know calling police is a bad thing no it's not a bad thing when you need you will call them but if you come police with tanks and guns and stuff and start shooting crazy then it's not a good thing like what happened and that's a great example actually 
where was that? Fortson, Missouri, right? Ferguson, Ferguson. Fortson. Ferguson. You know what happened in Ferguson? Yeah, the police's job was what? To protect you. But they didn't. They should over force, too much force. So when you have too much inflammation beyond control, it's a bad thing. It's a bad thing. Okay? Yeah. Um, so why wouldn't a person want to use steroids for an anti inflammatory? Unbelievable question. I was going to ask you that. But I'll tell you. Okay? All right. Very good. So <clears throat> let's do that. Now, let's go over the names. Okay? I just want to do this and then I want to delete this. Okay? So then I can tell you why. So corticosteroid inhibits this step. That's one thing. Please remember that. Okay? <clears throat> so they're the best anti inflammatory. Steroids are the best anti inflammatory there is. Now, <clears throat> COX 1 and 2 inhibitors are known as NSAIDs. NSAIDs or NSAID for one. NSAID. NSAID are non steroidal. They're not steroid, but they're still anti inflammatory. So, what you need to memorize steroids are anti inflammatory. <clears throat> steroids are anti inflammatory drugs. AID, aid. Steroids will always aid you, always help you. But when you say non steroidal, add NS to it. Okay? So steroids are the true anti-inflammatory drugs. But if you want to, there's a group of drugs that are not steroids, but they're also anti-inflammatory, but, but they are not steroids. So you call them non-steroid anti-inflammatory. See, steroid is such a big deal. Now, I don't, when I use the term steroid, please don't confuse that with anabolic steroid. I'm not talking about anabolic steroid. I'm talking about corticosteroids. Corticosteroids. Okay? Cortisol analogs. I'm talking about cortisol analogs. That's what corticosteroids. So NSAIDs, aspirin is one of them. Aspirin is famous because it inhibits both of these enzymes irreversible. Irreversibly. Other ones, like naproxen, reversible. Okay. Endomethacin, reversible. So you gotta memorize those names. We'll go over them. So at least do this. Do me a favor. <clears throat> Search. Do is this in the PowerPoint too? Diana? No? I'll see if I can do but I need to know the list of all those drugs in this category. And all of them here. You gotta memorize them. I can't help you with that. Memorize their name. What I will help you with, what is their side effect? What is their use? What is their mechanism? But memorizing list of drugs is your job. So memorize all the corticosteroid drugs. There should be about ten of them. And there should be about twenty NSAIDs. Memorize their names. And then I'll tell you which one are the most important ones. We'll talk about it. Yeah. Will we choose uh, an NSAID or? It depends on your mood. It depends on the condition. On the yeah. mood, yeah. Yeah. If you're in a bad mood and steroids is going to make it worse, don't use them. If you're in a bad mood and 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 NSAID will make it better, use that. So it all depends on the situation. Condition. Yeah. I just don't want to give him a straight answer. <laughs> okay. Now. So please, at least for now, you're going to memorize NSAIDs block COX-1 and 2. In their selective COX-2 inhibitors, Celecoxib, which are great medications. See, COX-1 inhibition leads to problems. COX-2 inhibition leads to good things. This is what we want to focus on. We want to only select, if we could selectively only inhibit, COX-2 would be a great idea. Okay. <clears throat> we want to do that. Okay, now let's do the next thing. Next thing is that, so we know that NSAIDs, okay, so let me do this. Please memorize NSAIDs, NSAID and corticosteroids, these medications. Know their mechanism. From this graph, you're going to get only one thing, mechanism. What do they do? What is the end result of this medication? What do they inhibit and what do they decrease? Corticosteroid inhibits phospholipase A2, it decreases everything. Look at trines, prostaglandin, and thromboxin, all three of them. Now, for COX-1 and 2 inhibitors, such as NSAIDs, NSAID inhibits COX-1 and 2. What does it do? It decreases thromboxin and prostaglandin.
glandons, but it has nothing to do with leukotrienes. Okay. <clears throat> leukotriene inhibitors. There are also leukotriene inhibitors. Leukotriene in receptor inhibitors and lipoxygenase inhibitor. Okay. <clears throat> do you know their names? Okay. Monty. It's actually just you, not LE. Lucas. Okay. Monty Lucas. Okay. All of them will end with Lucas. <laughs> Zafri Lucas. Zilutin. Zilutin is actually, these two are actually receptor inhibitors. Zilutin is lipoxygenase inhibitor. Zilutin. There you go. Okay, so look for those things. At the end of the day, now we have three major categories of drugs. Ooh. Whenever pharmacology is involved, you have to be getting chills because it will be tested for sure. Okay. List. List. I need the list of corticosteroids like prednisone, hydroxycorticosterones, hydrocortisol, and so forth. Okay. Prednisolone. Okay, dexamethasone, know the name. <laughs> okay. Are we good? Now I'm going to move out. Okay. The question was, when would you use corticosteroid? I'll use one famous one, prednisone. Okay, this is a corticosteroid. And let's compare this to aspirin. Okay, sometimes it's abbreviated ASA. Or naproxen or NSAIDs. Okay. <clears throat> See, corticosteroids are the strongest anti inflammatory that we know of, but guess what? So you can use them, that's fine. They are the same thing as cortisol. Corticosteroids are cousins of who? Cortisol. What does cortisol do? It increases blood glucose level, and corticosteroids will do that. It puts you at risk of diabetes and hyperglycemia. Okay. Now, as far as I know, cortisol also breaks down what? It increases breakdown of? Proteins. proteins. Excellent. Proteins. And your blood vessels are made of protein. Your muscles are made of protein. So it can cause muscle wasting. Not a good thing. This is not the same thing as anabolic steroid. This is actually catabolic steroid. Now, as far as we also know that corticosteroids <coughs> also increases breakdown of lipids, correct? Okay, that's a good thing. But what it does, it selectively takes lipids from your legs, lower extremities, and deposits them in the back. So it does redistribution. Redistribution. So it does redistribution of lipids. That's what cortisol does. Huh? I don't know. It's crazy. I have no idea. Because yeah. it's a stress hormone. It's a stress hormone. <coughs> yeah, but it's like the camel. How could you have it in the back? Oh, you, you, can get a, you can get a hump. Oh. Yeah. Especially in the truncal area. So that it's called truncal obesity. Legs are thin. So pe people who have increased cortisol, abnormal secretion of cortisol, they're known as Cushing's disease or Cushing's syndrome. And when you see them, you can see them there always. They th th you know, you've you seen that show. You should watch TV, it will help you. Um, what is that kid's movie? Despicable Me, I think, right? Yeah. What do you think of the, the, the main guy? Thin legs and big upper body. Okay. So now, on top of that, cor cortisol has activity like aldosterone, so it causes edema. Not a normal concentration, and too much. So, <clears throat> corticosteroids can do that, but now, what is protein breakdown? Muscles are made of what? Protein. protein. Bones are made of what? Protein. protein. Especially in children, corticosteroids are contraindicated. You should never use them in children, because it can cause bone growth <coughs> retardation. Okay? So that's just some effect. Now, antibodies, what are they made of? Protein. Proteins. So, on top of that, corticosteroids suppresses the immune system immune system isn't immune system the 
basis of inflammation so it has a lot of negative effects they are good when it comes to inflammation but they have so much side effects that you have to be careful so they're not preferred drug of choice immediately when you have no choice you will use them and if you do use them it's I prefer local injection rather than oral intake systemic steroid is completely you should be very very careful systemic I mean the entire body gets affected that's oral so usually use injection for rheumatoid arthritis maybe osteoarthritis and things like that you have no option you can use them okay but local injections and it'll be good for six months in most cases so you can, and some patients prefer to have a uh, one shot and for six months they have to not worry about taking medication okay so that's for corticosteroids <clears throat> now NSAIDs see NSAID one of the they are much safer than them but they have one problem and that is the decreases prostaglandin E2 which is a vasodilator yeah it's a vasodilator so prostaglandin E2 the major side effect what they do is and they're taking I mean prostaglandin aspirin or NSAIDs let me just put NSAID because I'm gonna keep reading it wrong you know NSAID in this case especially aspirin and naproxen and those guys if you take them for control of rheumatoid arthritis back pain and things like that see aspirin is okay to take it orally so much much more safer than corticosteroids okay guess what when you take it orally aspirin will accumulate where in the stomach until about 45 minutes or so until you take it away and then it's absorbed you have a huge chunk of aspirin molecules okay <clears throat> in the stomach so it will cause in the stomach area in that local area of the stomach let's say the greater curvature or smaller curvature over here here you have decrease in prostaglandin E2 as far as I know and you know prostaglandin E2 causes vasodilation that means in this area there is decreased vasodilation if anything it's vasoconstriction when blood vessels constrict what happens to the cell in this area they go through ischemia they go through ischemia they're not getting enough blood it's just like heart attack you can call it stomach attack very good and the cells will die and they will shut and that will lead to ulcers so aspirin or NSAIDs long-term use not one-time use not three-time use we're talking about months can lead to GI bleed the most important complication of NSAID is GI bleed and that's because of COX-1 inhibition not COX-2 not COX-2 okay so we'll look for ulcers so it increase the risk of ulcer or GI bleed okay <clears throat> so now you can use regardless no matter where it can some of them can get actually uncoated so because you have lipase you have so forth okay now there's something you can use you can use prostaglandin analog prostaglandin E2 analog in combination with NSAIDs and that's known as mesoprostol mesoprostol is a prostaglandin analog produced in factories or pharmaceutical companies you can use a combination with this only to do one thing to prevent gastric ulcers or GI bleed yeah so why do you say it's a blood that does it increase the migration or the uh, I guess sending of the glucose or does it increase the amount of white blood so why do you call it blood ah exactly yeah It has nothing to do with leukotrienes. <clears throat> it inhibits only cyclooxygen is one and two. Aspirin. Now, how would that lead to protection of thrombotic events? So it decreases thromboxane two. It's, it's because of thromboxane two. Yeah. And that question I do ask. You did them a favor. You reminded them. <laughs> Why does aspirin help in prevention of heart attack and stroke? Prevention of heart attack and stroke because it decreases thromboxin E2, not prostaglandin, not prostacyclin. Don't choose those <laughs> or look at trienes. It's only because thromboxin A2. Thromboxin A2, <clears throat> remember, causes thrombotic events. It's a prothrombotic. Aspirin decreases it, so that's how it helps. This is why, see, in low concentration, aspirin 
<coughs> will act on thromboxin A2 more than leukotrienes. At high concentration, it acts on leukotrienes, I mean, sorry, prostaglandins more. So, okay. Mm. Now, <coughs> COX-2 don't have inflammatory effect. COX-1 does. So it doesn't have vasoconstriction, vasodilatory effect. COX-1? Yeah. So COX-2, you won't have vasoconstriction. If you inhibit it, vasoconstriction is not affected, so you won't have GI bleed. Yeah. It's only... It's better it, to act on the COX-2. Of course. Because COX-2 is primarily responsible for inflammation. Not for so much for vasoconstriction. Okay, so, but in, in COX-1, you can... If you inhibit it, they will lead to vasoconstriction. That's the major difference. Yeah, the major difference is GI bleeding. Silicoxib is the one that's usually only selectively cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor, and, and it's expensive. Yeah, and it wouldn't cause, for example, GI bleed. It's expensive. I think so. And this has got cheaper now. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> so there you go. These you should know.